right, everybody can hear me? Yep. Okay, so Jim Culkin, Rick Engineering. Um, actually, we're gonna be 60 years here in San Diego, so my mom actually came in at birth on the floor, and that's where I started. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, next slide. <clears throat> uh, as Stephanie said, I, I'm gonna kind of tell you the purpose between uh, why LID. It really is, you know, we get a tremendous amount of pollutions and, and oils, and cigarette butts, and dirt on our on our roadways, on our roofs, and basically when it rains, before it used to go into our storm drains down our rivers and, and storm drains up our to our oceans. And really the purpose is now is the first flush of rain. When it first rains, that all is collected in some type of device and cleans it up. Secondly, what's really important is slowing it down. A lot of people don't realize that a map, the amount of runoff we used to have had a lot of downstream erosion, and that caused pollution into our rivers. And so that's really the purpose between um, the four LID uh, principles. I'll take the next one. <clears throat> so a couple of simple uh, LID um, uh, principles of design. Uh, porous paving is one of them. That could also be any kind of porous paving in a sense of green roofs. And I'll talk a little bit more on how that really helps your design out and sense your size of bioretention. Uh, I think Stephanie kind of showed this where a, uh, you have a holding tank. Um, this is a very interesting device in the sense that you have to understand that it's going to collect the first rain. But typically when we have the first rain, we're going to have a tremendous amount of uh, water in the soil. So we're not going to be able to use it for our irrigation. And a lot of people don't realize that then you're going to have to have a tank big enough to collect the second rainfall and maybe the third rainfall before we really can use it. But there's a couple of conditions where you can actually slowly reduce it into our, our, a, a bioretention or into the soil. And we've seen a project actually, this was in a underneath a playground equipment on an upper elevation. So all the water was collected there. Then it was discharged into a bioretention. This is bioretention here, but it's bioretention and retention. And so really where you actually are collecting the water and cleaning it, but you're actually storing water for a longer time. This is a horrible looking graphic that I'm going to show you later. So we're going to go to the next one. So some samples of uh, bioretention are these uh, systems. This is bioretention flow control. Again, a retention and bioretention. Uh, I think this is a beautiful uh, project. Um, I think actually I'll give credit to Jim Neary on this one. Uh, these, these facilities do not have to look like retention bioretention. They can actually be a very beautiful facility. A bioretention or bioswale, um, this is a typical one. This is done all the time where you're actually collecting, uh, you're making your parking lot islands bioretention and, and you're taking everything from your roofs and your roadways into bottle retention islands. Very common again on streetscapes, just bottle retentions within uh, hardscapes. <clears throat> so I'm going to take some time here. This is a typical bottle retention. And so uh, typically what you have is you have um, either typically 12 inches of bottle retention soil, 18 inches of gravel and then you have a collection pit down here or a, a, a drain pipe. On the side, you have either three to ones, I've seen them two to ones, I've seen a one to one, but you have side slopes to them. Many times you have a, uh, a liner, and in fact, I would have to tell you, I, I just got my first project without a liner. Um, liners are typically required because soils engineers do not want you these are heavy saturated areas that get a lot of concentration of water so you have a tendency to have uh, damage to your foundations uh, utility lines your uh, soil uh, road base you can jeopardize and damage those things by these bioretentions one thing i've learned is as a, a kind of a trade i think is that when you go to a soils engineer and say, hey, I, do I need a bioretention or do I need a liner? One thing I've learned to ask them, can I have cutoff liners? Can I go down with liners here and open it up here? And that's a really great thing to do because then you can actually introduce trees and other things in it. Because with this liner only being so uh, shallow, 
you're not going to be able to put a tree in. Trees really help bioretention uh, 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 the surfaces. They actually take the bottom of it and they open it up and they allow infiltration into the subsurface. Not shown here, but typically there's a pipe that goes up and a lot of times this area is uh, what's freeboard or a flooding area. That can be six inches, that can be 12 inches. It depends on the engineering of these and how much you're trying to do uh, flow control on it. And so typically they come up and they stand there. So in other words, the first flush, everything goes in. The second flush, these things start filling up. I think Stephanie showed one, completely filled up. They can have an, an, a rain event here. I think it happened in like six or seven years we had a rain event here. But they can actually fill up and actually be standing water there designed for three days. So we'll talk about plant material with that consideration. Take the next one. So really, bottom retention, in my opinion, is really a multi-discipline uh, solution to it. We'll start with architecture and site planning. As a landscape architect, are you doing any site planning? And you're doing uh, master plans or general plans or tentative map. If you're not taking consideration the area necessary for treatment um, as part of your early planning, you're not really doing your job, in my opinion. One rule of thumb that I give a lot of people, if you took all your non-porous service, surfaces, that would be your roofs, your, your walkways, your, and your, your roads, and if it was a simple site and you could drain one area, how big would your bioretention be? It's about 6% of that area. So if you keep that in mind, it, it varies from 4 to 8, but for early planning, that's a good way to look at it. Water resource, it's kind of a special uh, part of civil engineering, but they're the people who are actually figuring out your dra uh, drainage patterns to your sites, and then they actually sizing your bioretention. Civil engineers are actually doing all the grading and grading those things in there. Landscape architects are taking everything that civil engineer, engineers are doing and we actually just just throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> any, any engineers here? Oh, uh, I work for about 200 of them, so as much as I can do to badmouth them as much as possible. But really, our job as a landscape architect is really, they're going to tell you that the bioretention looks like this, and it's not really us. I'm sorry. <laughs> but really, our job is to really make these bioretention integrate in part of the landscape, integrate in part of the, the site. Uh, geotechnical soils engineer. I would have to say, and I don't think I see a lot of landscape architects do it, but I see a lot of architects do it. They think they can design these bioattentions without any input from a, a, geo, a, a geotech. That's an extreme risk that they're taking, that not getting the consideration of what uh, liners, or liners are necessary and those kind of things. I, I threw in survey because we're going to talk a little bit about implementation of the soil, how to put it in, what's the compaction of it. It's very, very important if you have big bio retentions or big basins, you need to have certain sizes, so maybe construction staking is necessary. But we really uh, uh, believe that actually the finished grade needs to be field checked. Because they're going to settle down, and that's, that finished grade needs to be exactly what it is, and maybe bio retention needs to be added to it. Also, we talked about the uh, overflow pipe. That needs to be uh, field uh, checked as well to make sure that that overflow is exactly what it is. Uh, just an interesting thing, we had a contractor cut all the overflow pipes and put them down into the bottom, uh, right on the bottom of the uh, soil level because he thought they were installed wrong. So, uh, next slide please. <clears throat> so, uh, talking a little bit about soils, um, I, I mentioned this I think last time, but I'll bring it up again. Um, the, the, the basic soil mix was a 70% sand, 30% compost. Um, and so that came really from Oregon It worked its way down here. Uh, the big difference between Oregon and San Diego is about 36 inches of rainfall a year versus what we get. Um, they also have subsurface water or subsurface uh, soils that drain really well. And so what we did when we started doing this, and we had a lot of projects when the 2007 permit went in effect, we had a lot of projects installed. And we had a tremendous amount of problems with uh, keeping the plant material alive. I, again, I, uh, I feel bad about making fun of engineers. But a lot of engineers will tell you it doesn't matter what 
the plant material is. It's the soil that's capturing all the pollutants, and that's really not true. It is true that it's capturing the, um, the pollutants, but actually the plants are taking that pollutants out of the soil. So they are equally important, so it's so important to have that plant material in a healthy condition. Um, compaction was another thing. Um, again, I got this a lot, that, you know, we have to specify a compaction. So is it 85 or 90, 95? Um, and we, what we saw is a lot of people coming in, specifying, well, sand, and they're gonna come in and put it at 95%, and basically they would drink. And so we had this flooding going on. I like how it fades away. Yeah. It's just, it's like, time's up. <laughs> So we came up, we, I should say we, we had a, 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 a committee of people um, that worked with the County of San Diego to come up with a, no, a new soil medicine. I mentioned this last time, and you can get that actually with a new handbook that came out, the LAD County Handbook has a new soil mix. And it's this mix. It's a much better mix. What it is is really that sandy loam has a little bit of silt and clay in it, so it really binds with the compost, it really keeps the soil moisture in there, and really is a much better mix. Um, also, I did mention, you know, I mentioned the 12 inches of soil versus 18 of compost. The city of San Diego has allowed you to reverse that. You can put 18 inch soil on 12. A lot of the Northern California and Northern states didn't like that because you get uh, hydroponic conditions at the deeper soil. I think that's great for San Diego. We just don't get that kind of rain. So reversing those things is a really great idea. Um, a couple other things that really need to be mentioned here is that appropriate plant material. Again, I, I mentioned that this, these, the bottom of these basins can hold water for three days. It's very rare, it only occurs at normal rainfall. Remember when it used to rain for three or four days here? That's the kind of event that happens. But if you think about it, I mean, not very many plant material uh, tolerate those conditions. That's why you see grasses a lot. Let's talk about other unappropriate plant material. Hey. <laughs> uh, uh, I see saw, I marathon too. I see it all the time. It grows great in bioretention. Think about it, you have a, a very light soil that leaches out all kinds of nitrogen. What does uh, uh, saw need to have? A lot of nitrogen. So the maintenance contractor goes, throws a whole bunch of nitrogen, high levels of nitrogen into the bioretention, he waters it in, it gets in the storm drain. We're just defeating the purpose of all this is about. So um, another thing that's interesting, Northern California and Oregon has banned that other mix of that compost and the reason behind that is that they have actually found it's leaching nitrates through the compost into the storm drain. So how we maintain these things are really quite important. Separation of irrigation. I think this is the one thing I see failure of besides plant material and maybe the combination of the two is that there's no separation between the two systems. Uh, side system where we have native soil and this very high porous soil. And so you think about it, well, one's going to dry out or one's going to get over water and typically with a water restriction, the bioretention is going to dry out faster and so then we have just all this dead plant material in these bioretentions. So we need to have separate irrigation systems in the bioretention. Okay, right, now you can do it. <laughs> Actually, I'm almost done. Can we go back? <laughs> um, no, 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 I'm going <laughs> uh, to talk about a little bit of uh, maintenance on these things. Um, uh, you know, typical thing is trash removal. Um, one thing that we are recommending, it's always recommended, it's about two inches of, com not compost, uh, mulch every year added to the bioretention. Uh, the reason behind that is the mulch, the compost that we're using in the soil is decomposing, and we need to have uh, bring more organic material back into it. Those things need to be done on it, so a, a mulch is required. A lot of times we also have foot traffic going over them all the time. They get compacted that way. Mulch helps that, it just provides that little cushion on it, so we don't have that compaction going on all the time. <clears throat> 
So, interesting enough, everybody who has a bioretention uh, as an owner has to certify. Really, now it's five minutes? Now, uh, everybody who has bioretention has to certify that these bioretentions are working every year. Is that correct? I'm saying that right? And it's so interesting to me because I have gone to shopping centers and see them and they've actually just pulled them out because they look like crap. I should be saying this, right? And so, and so the owner doesn't know anything about it. And so they're really pulling these things out and re -landscape. You know, they look terrible and they, they want them re-landscaped. You know, your clients really have to understand. And, and as a landscape architect, we have to design these things correctly so they, they do look good and they, they don't get pulled out. And the owners are not subject to lying that they work well and they look <laughs> So another thing too, I mean, all the, everything needs fertilizing and things like that. You can understand that if we're putting high nitrogen fertilizer releasing during winter time, the release, releasing nitrogen into the storm drain, that's not the purpose behind it. So maintenance specifications, we need to fertilize it with organic or slow release fertilizers in summer times and not uh, during uh, uh, rain events. That's it. Thank you very much.